chapter three of the theory of psychoanalysis by carl gustav jung this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the conception of libido freud had already introduced the idea of libido in his three contributions to the sexual theory in the following words in biology the fact that both mankind and animals have a sexual want is expressed by the conception of the sexual desire this is done by analogy with the want of nourishment so-called hunger popular speech has no corresponding characterization for the word hunger and so science uses the word libido in freud's definition the term libido appears as exclusively a sexual desire libido as a medical term is certainly used for sexual desire and especially for sexual lust but the classical definition of this word as found in cicero sallust and others was not so exclusive the word is there used in a more general sense for every passionate desire i only just mention this definition here as further on it plays an important part in our considerations and as it is important to know that the term libido has really a much wider meaning than is associated with it through medical language the idea of libido while maintaining its sexual meaning in the author's sense as long as possible offers us the dynamic value which we are seeking in order to explain the shifting of the psychological scenery with this conception it is much simpler to formulate the phenomena in question instead of by the incomprehensible substitution of the homo by the heterosexual component we may say now that the libido has gradually withdrawn from its homosexual manifestation and is transferred in the same measure into a heterosexual manifestation thus the homosexual component practically disappears it remains only an empty possibility signifying nothing in itself its very existence therefore is rightly denied by the laity just as we doubt the possibility that any man selected at random would turn out to be a murderer by the use of this conception of libido many relations between the isolated sexual functions are now easily explicable the early idea of the multiplicity of sexual components must be given up it savours too much of the ancient philosophical notion of the faculties of the mind its place is taken by libido which is capable of manifold applications the earlier components only represent possibilities of activities with this conception of libido the original idea of a divided sexuality with different roots is replaced by a dynamic unity without which the formerly important components remain but empty possibilities of activities this development in our conception is of great importance we have here the same process which robert mayer introduced into dynamics just as the conception of the conservation of energy removed their character as elements from the forces imparting to them the character of a manifestation of energy so the libido theory similarly removes from the sexual components the idea of the mental faculties as elements Celine vera mergen and describes to them merely phenomenal value this conception represents the impression of reality far more than the theory of components with a libido theory we can easily explain the case of the young man the disappointment he met with just at the time he had definitely decided on a heterosexual life drove his libido again from the heterosexual manifestation into a homosexual form thus calling forth his entire homosexuality the energic theory of libido i must point out here that the analogy with the law of the conservation of energy is very close in both cases the question arises when an effect of energy disappears where is this energy meanwhile and where will it re-emerge applying this point of view as a heuristic principle to the psychology of human conduct we shall make some astonishing discoveries then we shall see how the most heterogeneous phases of individual psychological development are connected in an energic relationship every time we see a person who is splenetic or has a morbid conviction or some exaggerated mental attitude we know here is too much libido and the excess must have been taken away from somewhere else where there is too little from this standpoint psychoanalysis is that method which discovers those places or functions where there is too little or too much libido and restores the just proportions 
thus the symptoms of a neurosis must be considered as exaggerated and correspondingly disturbed functional manifestations overflowing with libido the energy which has been used for this purpose has been taken away from somewhere else and it is the task of the psychoanalyst to restore it whence it was taken or to bestow it where it was never before given those complexes of symptoms which are mainly characterized by lack of libido for instance the so-called apathetic conditions force us to reverse the question here we have to ask where did the libido go the patient gives us the impression of having no libido and there are occasionally physicians who believe exactly what the patients tell them such physicians have a primitive way of thinking like the savage who believes when he sees an eclipse of the sun that the sun has been swallowed up and put to death but the sun is only hidden and so it is with these patients although the libido is there it is not get addible and is inaccessible to the patient himself superficially we have here a lack of libido it is the task of psychoanalysis to search for that hidden place where the libido dwells and where it is as a rule inaccessible to the patient the hidden place is the non-conscious which may also be called the unconscious without ascribing to it any mysterious significance the conception of unconscious fantasy psychoanalytic experience has taught us that there are non-conscious systems which by analogy with conscious fantasies can be described as fantasy systems of the unconscious in cases of neurotic apathy these fantasy systems of the unconscious are the objects of the libido we know well that when we speak of unconscious fantasy systems we only speak figuratively we do not mean more by this than that we accept as an indispensable postulate the conception of psychic entities existing outside consciousness experience teaches us we might say daily that there are unconscious psychic processes which influence the disposition of the libido in a perceptible way those cases known to every psychiatrist in which complicated systems of delusions emerge with relative great suddenness show clearly that there must be unconscious psychic development and preparation for we cannot regard them as having been just suddenly formed when they entered consciousness the sexual terminology i feel myself justified in making this digression concerning the unconscious i have done it to point out that with regard to shifting of the manifestations of the libido we have to deal not only with the conscious but also with another factor the unconscious whither the libido sometimes disappears we have not yet followed up the discussion of the further consequences which result from the adoption of the libido theory freud has taught us and we see it in the daily practice of psychoanalysis that in earlier childhood instead of the normal later sexuality we find many tendencies which in later life are called perversions we have to admit that freud has the right to give to these tendencies a sexual terminology through the introduction of the conception of the libido we see that in adults those elementary components which seem to be the origin and the source of normal sexuality lose their importance and are reduced to mere potentialities the effective power their life force is to be found in the libido without libido these components mean nothing we saw that freud gives to the conception of libido an undoubted sexual definition somewhat in the sense of sexual desire the general view is that libido in this sense only comes into being at the age of puberty how are we then to explain the fact that in freud's view a child has a polymorphic perverse sexuality and that therefore in children the libido brings into action not only one but several possibilities if the libido in freud's sense begins its existence at puberty it could not be held accountable for earlier infantile perversions in that case we should have to regard these infantile perversions as faculties of the mind in the sense of the theory of components apart from the hopeless theoretical confusion which would thus arise we must not multiply explanatory principles in accordance with the philosophical axiom principia praeter necessitatum non sunt multiplicanda there is no other way but to agree that before and after puberty it is the same libido hence the perversities of childhood have arisen exactly in the same way as those of adults common sense will object to this as obviously the sexual needs of children cannot possibly be the same as those of adults we might admit with freud that the libido before and after puberty is the same but is different in its intensity instead of the intense post pubertal sexual desire there would be first a slight sexual desire in childhood with diminishing intensity until as we reach back to the first year it is but a trace 
we might admit that we are biologically in agreement with this formulation it would then have to be also agreed that everything that falls into the region of this enlarged conception of sexuality is already pre-existing but in miniature for instance all those emotional manifestations of psychosexuality desire for affection jealousy and many others and by no means least the neuroses of childhood it must however be admitted that these emotional manifestations of childhood by no means make the impression of being in miniature their intensity can rival that of an effect among adults nor must it be forgotten that experience has shown that perverse manifestations of sexuality in childhood are often more glaring and indeed seem to have a greater development than in adult if an adult under similar conditions had this apparently excessive form of sexuality which is practically normal in children we could rightly expect a total absence of normal sexuality and of many other important biological adaptations an adult is rightly called perverse when his libido is not used for normal functions and the same could be said of a child it is polymorphous perverse since it does not know normal sexual functions these considerations suggest the idea that perhaps the amount of libido is always the same and that no increase first occur at puberty this somewhat audacious conception accords with the example of the law of the conservation of energy according to which the quantity of energy remains always the same it is possible that the summit of maturity is reached when the infantile diffuse applications of libido discharge themselves into the one channel of definite sexuality and thus lose themselves therein for the moment we must content ourselves with these suggestions for we must next pay attention to one point of criticism concerning the quality of the infantile libido many critics do not admit that the infantile libido is simply less intense or is essentially of the same kind as the libido of adults the emotions among adults are correlated with the genital functions this is not the case in children or it is only so in miniature or exceptionally and this gives rise to an important distinction which must not be undervalued i believe such an objection is justified there is really a considerable difference between immature and fully developed functions as there is a difference between play and reality between shooting with blank and with loaded cartridges that the childish libido has the harmlessness demanded by common sense cannot be contested but of course none can deny that blank shooting is shooting we must get accustomed to the idea that sexuality really exists even before puberty right back in early childhood and that we have no right to pretend that manifestations of this immature sexuality are not sexual this does not indeed refute the objection which while recognizing the existence of infantile sexuality in the form already described yet denies for its claim to regard as sexual early infantile manifestations such as sucking we have mentioned already the motives which induce freud to enlarge the sexual terminology in such a way we mentioned too how this very act of sucking for instance could be conceived from the standpoint of pleasure in the function of nutrition and that on biological grounds there was more justification for this derivation than for freud's view it might be objected that these and similar activities of the oral zones are found in later life in an undoubted sexual use this only means that these activities can in later life be used for sexual purposes but that does not tell us anything concerning the primitive sexual nature of these forms i must therefore admit that i find no ground for regarding the activities of the suckling which provoke pleasure and satisfaction from the standpoint of sexuality indeed there are many objections against this conception it seems to me in so far as i am capable of judging these difficult problems that from the standpoint of sexuality it is necessary to divide human life into three phases the three phases of life the first phase embraces the first years of life i call this part of life the pre-sexual stage these years correspond to the caterpillar stage of butterflies and are characterized almost exclusively by the functions of nutrition and growth the second phase embraces the later years of childhood up to puberty and might be called the pre pubertal stage the third phase is that of riper years proceeding only from puberty onwards and could be called the time of maturity you cannot have failed to notice that we become conscious of the greatest difficulty when we arrive at the question of what age we must put the limit of the pre-sexual stage i am ready to confess my uncertainty with regard to this problem if i survey the psychoanalytical experiences with children as yet insufficiently numerous at the same time keeping in mind the observations made by freud it seems to me that the limit of this phase lies between the third and fifth years 
this of course with due consideration for the greatest individual diversities from various aspects this is an important age the child has emancipated itself already from the helplessness of the baby and a series of important psychological functions have acquired a firm hold from this period on the obscurity of the early infantile amnesia or the discontinuity of the early infantile consciousness begins to clear up through the sporadic continuity of memory it seems as if at this age a considerable step had been made towards emancipation and the formation of a new and independent personality as far as we know the first signs of interest and activity which may fairly be called sexual fall into this period although these sexual indications have still the infantile characteristics of harmlessness and naivete i think i have sufficiently demonstrated why a sexual terminology cannot be given to the pre-sexual stage and so we may now consider the other problems from the standpoint we have just reached you will remember that we dropped the problem of the libido in childhood because it seemed impossible to arrive at any clearness in that way but now we are obliged to take up the question again if only to see whether the energy conception harmonizes with the principles just advanced we saw following freud's conception that the altered manifestations of the infantile sexuality if compared with those of maturity are to be explained by the diminution of sexuality in childhood the sexual definition of libido must be abandoned the intensity of the libido is said to be diminished relatively to the early age but we advance just now several considerations to show why it seems doubtful if we can regard the vital functions of a child sexuality accepted as of less intensity than those of adults we can really say that sexuality accepted the emotional phenomena and if nervous symptoms are present then these likewise are quite as intense as those of adults on the energic conception of the libido all these things are but manifestations of the libido but it becomes rather difficult to conceive that the intensity of the libido can ever constitute the difference between a mature and an immature sexuality the explanation of this difference seems rather to postulate a change in the localization of the libido if the expression be allowed in contradistinction to the medical definition of libido in children is occupied far more with certain side functions of a mental and physiological nature than with local sexual functions one is here already tempted to remove from the term libido the predicate sexualis and thus to have done with the sexual definition of the term given in freud's three contributions this necessity becomes imperative when we put it in the form of a question the child in the first years of his life is intensely living suffering and enjoying the question is whether his striving his suffering his enjoyment are by reason of his libido sexualis freud has pronounced himself in favour of this supposition there is no need to repeat the reasons through which i am compelled to accept the pre-sexual stage the larva stage possesses a libido of nutrition if i may so express it but not yet the libido sexualis it is thus we must put it if we wish to keep the energic conception which the libido theory offers us i think there is nothing for it but to abandon the sexual definition of libido or we shall lose what there is valuable in the libido theory that is the energic conception for a long time past the desire to extend the meaning of libido and to remove it from its narrow and sexual limitations has forced itself upon freud's school one was never weary of insisting that sexuality in the psychological sense was not to be taken too literally but in a broader connotation but exactly how that remained obscure and thus to sincere criticism remained unsatisfied i do not think i am going astray if i see the real value of the libido theory in the energy conception and not in its sexual definition thanks to the former we are in possession of a most valuable heuristic principle we owe to the energy conception the possibility of dynamic ideas and relationships which are of inestimable value for us in the chaos of the psychic world the freudians would be wrong not to listen to the voice of criticism which reproaches our conception of libido with mysticism and inaccessibility we deceived ourselves in believing that we could ever make the libido sexualis the bearer of the energic conception of the psychical life and if many of freud's school still believe they possess a well-defined and almost complete conception of libido they are not aware that this conception has been put to use far beyond the bounds of its sexual definition the critics are right when they object to our theory of libido as explaining things which cannot belong to its sphere 
it must be admitted that freud's school makes use of a conception of libido which passes beyond the bounds of its primary definition indeed this must produce the impression that one is working with a mystical principle the problem of libido and dementia precox i have sought to show these infringements in a special work Wandlungen und symbol der libido and at the same time the necessity for creating a new conception of libido which shall be in harmony with the energic conception freud himself was forced to a discussion of his original conception of libido when he tried to apply its energic point of view to a well-known case of dementia precox the so-called schreber case in this case we had to deal among other things with that well-known problem in the psychology of dementia precox the loss of adaptation to reality the peculiar phenomenon consisting in a special tendency of these patients to construct an inner world of fantasy of their own surrendering for this purpose their adaptation to reality as a part of the phenomenon the lack of sociability or emotional rapport will be well known to you all this representing a striking disturbance of the function of reality through considerable psychological study of these patients we discover that this lack of adaptation to reality is compensated by a progressive increase in the creation of fantasies this goes so far that the dream world is for the patient more real than external reality the patient schreber described by freud found for this phenomenon an excellent figurative description in his delusion of the end of the world his loss of reality is thus very concretely represented the dynamic conception of this phenomenon is very clear we say that the libido withdrew itself more and more from the external world consequently entered the inner world the world of fantasies and had there to create as a compensation for the lost external world a so-called equivalent of reality this compensation is built up piece by piece and it is most interesting to observe the psychological materials of which this inner world is composed this way of conceiving the transposition and displacement of the libido has been made by the everyday use of the term its original pure sexual meaning being very rarely recalled in general the word libido is used practically in so harmless a sense that Claparetta, in a conversation once remarked that we could as well use the word interest the manner in which this expression is generally used has given rise to a way of using the term that made it possible to explain schreber's end of the world by withdrawal of the libido on this occasion freud recalled his original sexual definition of the libido and tried to arrive at an understanding with the change which in the meantime had taken place in his article on schreber he discusses the question whether what the psychoanalytic school calls libido and conceives of as interest from erotic sources coincides with interest generally speaking you see that putting the problem in this way freud asked the question which Klapperetta practically answered freud discusses the question here whether the loss of reality noticed in dementia precox to which i drew attention in my book the psychology of dementia precox is due entirely to the withdrawal of erotic interest or if this coincides with the so-called objective interest in general we can hardly agree that the normal function du real jeanne is only maintained through erotic interest the fact is that in many cases reality vanishes altogether and not a trace of psychological adaptation can be found in these cases reality is repressed and replaced by fantasies created through complexes we are forced to say that not only the erotic interest but interests in general that is the whole adaptation to reality are lost i formerly tried in my psychology of dementia precox to get out of this difficulty by using the expression psychic energy because i could not base the theory of dementia precox on the theory of transference of the libido in its sexual definition my experience at that time chiefly psychiatric did not permit me to understand this theory only later did i learn to understand the correctness of the theory as regards the neuroses by increased experience in hysteria and the compulsion neurosis as a matter of fact an abnormal displacement of libido quite definitely sexual does play a great part in the neuroses but although very characteristic repressions of sexual libido do take place in certain neuroses that loss of reality so typical for dementia precox never occurs in dementia precox so extreme is the loss of the function of reality that this loss must also entail a loss of motive power to which any sexual nature must be absolutely denied for it will not seem to any one that reality is a sexual function if this were so the withdrawal of erotic interests in the neuroses would lead to a loss of reality a loss of reality indeed that could be compared with that in dementia precox but as i have said before this is not the case 
these facts have made it impossible for me to transfer freud's libido theory to dementia precox hence my view is that the attempt made by abraham in his article the psychosexual differences between hysteria and dementia precox is from the standpoint of freud's conception of libido theoretically untenable abraham's belief that the paranoidal system or the symptomatology of dementia precox arises by the libido withdrawing from the external world cannot be justified if we take libido according to freud's definition for as freud has clearly shown a mere introversion or regression of the libido leads always to a neurosis and not to dementia precox it is impossible to transfer the libido theory with its sexual definition directly to dementia precox as this disease shows a loss of reality not to be explained by the deficiency in erotic interests it gives me particular satisfaction that our master also when he placed his hand on the fragile material of paranoic psychology felt himself compelled to doubt the applicability of his conception of libido which had prevailed hitherto my position of reserve towards the ubiquity of sexuality which i allowed myself to adopt in the preface to my psychology of dementia precox although with a complete recognition of the psychological mechanism was dictated by the conception of the libido theory at that time its sexual definition did not enable me to explain those disturbances of functions which affect the indefinite sphere of the instinct of hunger just as much as they do those of sexuality for a long time the libido theory seemed to me inapplicable to dementia precox the genetic conception of libido with greater experience in my analytical work i noticed that a slow change of my conception of libido had taken place a genetic conception of libido gradually took the place of the descriptive definition of libido contained in freud's three contributions thus it became possible for me to replace by the expression psychic energy the term libido the next step was that i asked myself if nowadays the function of reality consists only to a very small extent of sexual libido and to a very large extent of other impulses it is still a very important question considered from the phylogenetic standpoint whether the function of reality is not at least very largely of sexual origin it is impossible to answer this question directly in so far as the function of reality is concerned we shall try to come to some understanding by a side path a superficial glance at the history of evolution suffices to teach us that innumerable complicated functions whose sexual character must be denied are originally nothing but derivations from the instinct of propagation as is well known there has been an important displacement in the fundamentals of propagation during the ascent through the animal scale the offspring has been reduced in number and the primitive uncertainty of impregnation has been replaced by a quite assured impregnation and a more effective protection of offspring the energy required for the production of eggs and sperma has been transferred into the creation of mechanisms of attraction and mechanisms for the protection of offspring here we find the first instincts of art in animals used for the instinct of propagation and limited to the rutting season the original sexual character of these biological institutions became lost with their organic fixation and their functional independence none the less there can be no doubt as to their sexual origin as for instance there is no doubt about the original relation between sexuality and music but it would be a generalization as futile as unesthetic to include music under the category of sexuality such a terminology would lead to the consideration of the cathedral of cologne under mineralogy because it has been built with stones those quite ignorant of the problems of evolution are much astonished to find how few things there are in human life which cannot finally be reduced to the instinct of propagation it embraces nearly everything i think that is dear and precious to us we have hitherto spoken of the libido as of the instinct of reproduction or the instinct of the preservation of the species and limited our conception to that libido which is opposed to hunger just as the instinct of the preservation of the species is opposed to that of self-preservation of course in nature this artificial distinction does not exist here we find only a continuous instinct of life a will to live which tries to obtain the propagation of a whole race by the preservation of the individual to this extent this conception coincides with that of schopenhauer's will as objectively we can only conceive a movement as a manifestation of an internal desire as we have already boldly concluded that the libido which originally subserved the creation of eggs and seed is now firmly organized in the function of nest building and can no longer be employed otherwise we are similarly obliged to include in this conception every desire hunger or no less we have no warrant whatever for differentiating essentially the desire to build nests from the desire to eat i think you will already understand the position we have reached with these considerations 
we were about to follow up the energic conception by putting the energic mode of action in place of the purely formal functioning just as reciprocal actions well known in the old natural science have been replaced by the law of the conservation of energy so here too in the sphere of psychology we seek to replace the reciprocal activities of coordinated psychical faculties by energy conceived as one and homogeneous thus we must bow to the criticism which reproaches the psychoanalytic school for working with a mystical conception of libido i have to dispel this illusion that the whole psychoanalytic school possesses a clearly conceived and obvious conception of libido i maintain that the conception of libido with which we are working is not only not concrete or known but is an unknown x a conceptual image a token and no more real than the energy in the conceptual world of the physicist in this wise only can we escape those arbitrary transgressions of the proper boundaries which are always made when we want to reduce coordinated forces to one another certain analogies of the action of heat with the action of light are not to be explained by saying that this tertium comparationis proves that the undulations of heat are the same as the undulations of light the conceptual image of energy is the real point of comparison if we regard libido in this way we endeavour to simulate the progress which has already been made in physics the economy of thought which physics has already obtained we strive after in our libido theory we conceive libido now simply as energy so that we are in the position to figure the manifold processes as forms of energy thus we replace the old reciprocal action by relations of absolute equivalence we shall not be astonished if we are met with the cry of vitalism but we are as far removed from any belief in a specific vital power as from any other metaphysical assertion we term libido that energy which manifests itself by vital processes which is subjectively perceived as aspiration longing and striving we see in the diversity of natural phenomena the desire the libido in the most diverse applications and forms in early childhood we find libido at first wholly in the form of the instinct of nutrition providing for the development of the body as the body develops there open up successively new spheres of influence for the libido the last and from its functional significance most overpowering sphere of influence is sexuality which at first seems very closely connected with the function of nutrition with that you may compare the well-known influence on propagation of the conditions of nutrition in the lower animals and plants in the sphere of sexuality libido does take that form whose enormous importance justifies us in the choice of the term libido in its strict sexual sense here for the first time libido appears in the form of an undifferentiated sexual primitive power as an energy of growth clearly forcing the individual towards division budding etc the clearest separation of the two forms of libido is found among those animals where the stage of nutrition is separated by the pupa stage from the stage of sexuality out of this sexual primitive power through which one small creature produces millions of eggs and sperm derivatives have been developed by extraordinary restriction of fecundity the functions of which are maintained by a special differentiated libido this differentiated libido is henceforth desexualized for it is dissociated from its original function of producing eggs and sperm nor is there any possibility of restoring it to its original function the whole process of development consists in the increasing absorption of the libido which only created originally products of generation in the secondary functions of attraction and protection of offspring this development presupposes a quite different and much more complicated relationship to reality a true function of reality which is functionally inseparable from the needs of reproduction thus the altered mode of reproduction involves a correspondingly increased adaptation to reality this of course does not imply that the function of reality is exclusively due to differentiation and reproduction i am aware that a large part of the instinct of nutrition is connected with it thus we arrive at an insight into certain primitive conditions of the function of reality it would be fundamentally wrong to pretend that the compelling source is still a sexual one it was largely a sexual one originally the process of absorption of the primitive libido into secondary functions certainly always took place in the form of so-called affluxes of sexual libido libidinosa sazusa that is to say sexuality was diverted from its original destination a definite quantity was used up in the mechanisms of mutual attraction and of protection of offspring this transference of sexual libido from the sexual sphere to associated functions is still taking place for example modern neo malthusianism is the artificial continuation of the natural tendency we call this process sublimation 
when this operation occurs without injury to the adaptation of the individual we call it repression when the attempt fails from the descriptive standpoint psychoanalysis accepts the multiplicity of instincts and among them the instinct of sexuality is a special phenomenon moreover it recognizes certain fluxes of the libido to a sexual instincts from the genetic standpoint it is otherwise it regards the multiplicity of instincts as issuing out of relative unity the primitive libido it recognizes that definite quantities of the primitive libido are split off associated with the recently created functions and finally merged in them from this standpoint we can say without any difficulty that patients with dementia precox withdraw their libido from the external world and in consequence suffer a loss of reality which is compensated by an increase of the fantasy building activities we must now fit the new conception of libido into that theory of sexuality in childhood which is of such great importance in the theory of neurosis generally speaking we first find the libido as the energy of vital activities acting in the zone of the function of nutrition through the rhythmical movements and the act of sucking nourishment is taken with all signs of satisfaction as the individual grows and his organs develop the libido creates new ways of desire new activities and satisfactions now the original model rhythmic activity creating pleasure and satisfaction must be transferred to other functions which have their final goal in sexuality this transition is not made suddenly at puberty but it takes place gradually throughout the course of the greater part of childhood the libido can only very slowly and with great difficulty detach itself from the characteristics of the function of nutrition in order to pass over into the characteristics of sexual function as far as i can see we have two epochs during this transition the epoch of sucking and the epoch of the displaced rhythmic activity considered solely from the point of view of its mode of action sucking clings entirely to the domain of the function of nutrition but it presents also a far wider aspect it is no mere function of nutrition it is a rhythmical activity with its goal in a pleasure and satisfaction of its own distinct from the obtaining of nourishment the hand comes into play as an accessory organ in the epoch of the displaced rhythmical activity it stands out still more as an accessory organ when the oral zone ceases to give pleasure which must now be obtained in other directions the possibilities are many as a rule the other openings of the body become the first objects of interest of the libido then follow the skin in general and certain places of predilection upon it the actions carried out at these places generally take the form of rubbing piercing tugging etc accompanied by a certain rhythm and serve to produce pleasure after a halt of greater or less duration at these stations the libido proceeds until it arrives at the sexual zone where it may next provoke the first onanistic attempts during its march the libido carries over not a little from the function of nutrition into the sexual zone this readily explains the numerous close associations between the function of nutrition and the sexual function this march of the libido takes place at the time of the pre-sexual stage which is characterized by the fact that the libido gradually relinquishes the special character of the instinct of nutrition and by degrees acquires the character of the sexual instinct at this stage we cannot yet speak of a true sexual libido therefore we are obliged to qualify the polymorphous perverse sexuality of early infancy differently the polymorphism of the tendencies of the libido at this time is to be explained as the gradual movement of the libido away from the sphere of the function of nutrition towards the sexual function the infantile perversity thus rightly vanishes the term perverse so strongly contested by our opponents for it provokes a false idea when a chemical body breaks up into its elements these elements are the products of its disintegration but it is not permissible on that account to describe elements as entirely products of disintegration perversities are disorders of fully developed sexuality but are never precursors of sexuality although there is undoubtedly an analogy between the precursors and the products of disintegration the childish rudiments no longer to be conceived as perverse but to be regarded as stages of development change gradually into normal sexuality as the normal sexuality develops the more smoothly the libido withdraws from its provisional positions the more completely and the more quickly does the formation of normal sexuality take place it is proper to the conception of normal sexuality that all those early infantile inclinations which are not yet sexual should be given up the less this is the case the more is sexuality threatened with perverse development the expression perverse is here used in its right place the fundamental condition of a perversity is an infantile imperfectly developed state of sexuality End of chapter three